Welcome to another episode of First Off, Let's Kill All the Lawyers. I'm David Heffernan, and I've been practicing personal injury law here for 30 years in South Florida. Uh, the goal behind this show, and we, we named it after the Shakespeare quote, although a lot of people argue that that was actually a compliment to lawyers, but people still chuckled pretty loudly when it was. And when you talk to people today, they still think maybe not a bad idea to kill all the lawyers. So goal here today is bring in other South Florida lawyers, different areas of law, kind of educate some people on it. Maybe one by one, we can kind of take some people off the kill list. So my guest this morning is is a, a great, great friend, uh, been for the last 30 years, uh, and a truly fantastic lawyer who does a lot of things that I know nothing about. So this is definitely going to be entertaining because I'm going to get to learn along. But, but let me bring in Dan Newman, a partner at Nelson Mullins. Dan, how are you? Great today. And hopefully I'm going to get off that kill list by the end of this show. Slowly. Well, I think we can get well, yeah, the majority at least. I don't know if we'll get everybody off that list with you, but but we can get the majority off. So, so Danny, let's let's go back and talk. Um, you went to George Washington. You studied finance. What was the path and, and, and why go to law school? Was that something that was always going to be done or, or, or had that come about? So when I went to college, I thought I was going to go into the investment field, investment banking or something investment related. I was a finance major, as you said, uh, bachelor of business administration. I took a business law class in, in my business curriculum and undergrad, and that really gave me a passion for the law. I had a great, a great teacher, and, um, and it, he taught us about contracts and about business deals and about litigation and, and how disputes arise and how there are different arguments and how to be an advocate. And, and that was fascinating to me. And so after my junior year in college, I decided that I wanted to go to law school and I wanted to be able to combine those, those two passions, the finance end and the legal end. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a litigator. I knew that I, that was probably the best fit for my personality. And uh, so that's, that's how it came about. All right. So so that now at least gives me an explanation as to how you know about contracts, because you and I had the same contracts teacher at, at University of Miami Law School. And I don't think we learned a whole lot about contracts in that class, but, but we'll leave that alone for now. We so, had a lot of laughs, though. We did. We did. So we become friends in law school. You get out of law school. You take a job with the SEC. And I think, oh, my God, that's fantastic. He's working for college football. Um, wasn't that SEC? So you go to New York for the Securities Exchange Commission. Let's talk about that because I think that's kind of fascinating. It, it was a great opportunity. It actually came about um, unexpectedly. There was there was the opportunity there. It was a bad time too. During that period of time, it was a, the uh, there was a banking crisis going on, and uh, there was there was a little bit downturn in the economy. And someone told me there was an opportunity to go work at the SEC um, and. So, and that was a passion of mine. It was finance, it was securities. I had taken securities law in college and uh, learned about the securities laws, learned about business and finance and tried to take courses fit for that in, in, in law school and uh, as well as the securities class in law school. Went up to the SEC, interviewed, extremely passionate about what they did, uh, what they do and continue to do there. They are, uh, you know, they, they essentially are the overseer of our financial markets in, in many different ways. And I went up and I worked for what's called the enforcement division of the SEC. And our job was to enforce the securities laws. So we would investigate potential violations and enforce those through legal actions. Many of the cases settled or, or they go to trial. And, uh, you know, in the process of that, I learned a tremendous amount. Fascinating cases, everything from insider trading, which everyone hears a lot about, financial filing fraud, where companies may file inaccurate information about what their numbers really look like and people rely upon that and and broker dealer uh, misconduct too I mean it was anything that could be a fraud in connection with securities markets we went at we, we, we would uh, that would be a aim of ours to investigate and potentially prosecute and enforce the laws which which again I think is is fascinating because it's something that we all sort of know a little about and you know we hear the Bernie Madoffs and things like that and the scams but but little things like you're talking about where information might intentionally be wrong and that misleads investors and things like that. So, so I mean, just the scope of that enforcement, how, how broad is the SEC and, and how much, I guess, do you catch? I mean, you know, everybody is it's sort of like the IRS, you know, oh, everybody cheats on their taxes, you know, but a lot of these companies do. And, and, and how broad is that enforcement? 
So the, the enforcement is, and I should say it's civil enforcement. The, the Department of Justice enforces criminally and prosecutes, and a lot of times there are, they work together because the facts are the same. But it, it is, um, as you said, there's a lot going on out there, and the agency can't, can't go after everyone, can't catch everything that's going on. So it, it tries to um, essentially go after cases that are going to have an impact on others, and they show the areas that are there uh, areas that they really want to make sure that people aren't engaging in misconduct, aren't defrauding people. And that actually changes by each chairman of the SEC. You'll see different areas where their focus may be. So when I was there, because of the banking crisis, I go back to that, a lot of the enforcement was directed to uh, bank holding companies. They were public companies that held these banks, and all these banks held real estate on their books at levels that just wasn't accurate. They were way overinflated. So their financials look great, but it wasn't really the case. And so that was a big, a big pet peeve of, of the chairman of the, of the SEC at that time. And also insider trading was always big. You had just come off of hearing about cases of uh, Michael Milken and, and, and others like that. There were a lot of insider trading cases out there. So those were, were big. And there was, you know, a lot of the enforcement, uh, the enforcement division is not, it's not huge, but it's pretty substantial. And there are enforcement attorneys throughout the country in different offices. And you see those big cases and they're meant to tell people, look, the SEC is out there. They're looking to enforce. Don't go sideways you know, with the law. Don't, don't even try and go up to the edge. I mean, look, you, 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 you know, they can even ultimately, and I know it was DOJ, but you know, take down Martha Stewart. So, you know, I mean, you could do insider trading and Snoop Dogg and Martha Stewart gets interesting. Yeah, it's a, uh, and, and inside of trading, those are tough cases. The fascinating things about those from well, no matter what side you're on it, but if you're in the SEC, it's like a puzzle. You're trying to put pieces of the puzzle together. You, you may see that there was a lot of trading before a big announcement and a, and a, a stock, the stock rose as a result of the announcement or the event, whatever it may be. Maybe there was an announcement of a merger with another company. And then you, you take a look at, okay, who, you know, what was going on with the trading? Why was there all this trading the day before the announcement? And then you try and look at who is trading and then try and figure out how they may or may not have known something. You know, look at phone records, calendars, relationships. And so they are fascinating cases. And uh, there, there are so many of them that just have amazing fact, I mean, fascinating fact patterns, really, on how people may have gotten the information. I mean, the bottom line now is today, too, things are so sophisticated. There are so many ways to determine how information flowed and where money's flowed that, um, and, and communications, that, uh, that there are a lot of ways to catch folks. So a, a little unrelated to that, but, but I mean, I, and I just read another article this morning. So you go back and, and GameStop basically seems to get manipulated through social media and goes through the roof. And now apparently Bed Bath & Beyond has something similar that's going on. How does that tie into things? And I mean, you know, without getting into a legal opinion, but, but, but that effect of social media is sort of playing with the market. What are your thoughts on that? It, it is. And it, it was uh, actually, a, and the S a study just came out recently on that. And, uh, you know, the, what, what the SEC and others were looking for is, was this some type of, um, you know, group effort, some type of mass manipulation that was spearheaded and the group moved? But, you know, there, what you have now is you have a lot more retail investors in the market because of, uh, because of broker dealers like Robinhood and others, you have people who never traded before in the market, and they're also out there on these blogs talking about things and talking about concepts. And they're moving; they are moving the stocks. And but it's not necessarily illegal. It could be if it's an organized effort to do that to manipulate the the stock. But it's difficult. It's difficult to know whether that's the case. But if it was. And if there were people that were at spearheading that, that would be illegal if that could be shown that it was happening. The other concept you have here, not to get too technical, is you have what's called a lot of short sellers out there on these stocks. And what happens is if a stock price starts going up, there's a short squeeze, which means that the short sellers, the people who sold the stock and don't own it, are saying, and, and their goal is to basically, if you sell the stock short, you think the price is going down. You're going to sell it high and then try and buy it back low, and that's where your profit is. If the stock price is going up, you have to cover that, that short sell, and that's what happens. A lot of them start covering, and that drives the price even higher and drives the momentum and the volume of the, of the stock even higher. Very, very interesting. So let's, let's take the wealth of, of what you learned from the SEC 
and you come back now to South Florida. Talk about that transition. What brought you back here? So what, what ultimately brought me back here is, um, is my fiance at the time and now wife was a, a, a Floridian and uh, she, she really liked living in Florida. And I really liked Florida and I had great friends down here like yourself and, and just really liked the, the lifestyle down here. So I, I came back down, uh, was looking for a firm that would give me the opportunity to do both business litigation, contracts, uh, you know, breach of contract, tortious interference, breach of non-competes, um, you know, business fraud, com- what I'll call commercial divorces, right? Two partners in a business don't get along and things like that and allow me to do the securities work from the other side. And, and so that I came down and I started working with a firm called, at that time, it was called Tuan Garcia Pedroza. And uh, it gave me the opportunity to do that and hone my litigation, my business litigation skills and learn construction litigation as well. So it was just a great opportunity for me to accomplish all that. Um, you know, and have the access to be able to learn new areas of law, because I think you always want to keep learning. Well, 100 percent. And, and we have to give props to Stephanie, who is a badass prosecutor in her own right, who's had a tremendous legal career. Maybe we'll have to get her on because it'd be very interesting to have a prosecutor on. So you can tee her up for that because I'm going to call her. I will. I will. All right. So you come down now. Now what I'm fascinated about is is so you come down and 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 the firm you start with is, is not a huge firm. Now things have sort of evolved and you've kind of gone the gambit because we'll, we'll get to Nelson Mullins, but, but now you're at an part of an 800 lawyer firm with 25 locations throughout the country. But, but talk about that transition, mid-sized firm, bigger firms to a very, very large firm. Now, what, what's the difference in the practice of law? So the, the, the difference is in the, when I went to, to uh, what was Tune Garcia Pedroza, ultimately it was two cardness at the end by the time I had left. It was what we call boutique litigation firm. It did very um, high end um, business litigation at a, at a very so- sophisticated high end level, but you could, you could represent, um, you had a lot more flexibility on, on who your clients may or may not be, right? Because as lawyers, we always have to check for conflicts that no one else in our firm represents the other side that we may be in litigation with. But it really gave me the opportunity. What I, and what I still think was the greatest thing is, you know, it puts your feet to the fire right away. You're either, you know, you or the cement on the shoes. You're going to sink or swim. Right. You're going to learn. You run a, it. The cases were lean and mean. It was a partner and an associate, and you had to be familiar and know everything. And you had to jump in and and learn how to be a litigator, um, you know, right away, and 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 learn by doing. Which I still, you know, there there are different theories on that, but you know, you always want people that are overseeing you and mentoring you and teaching you. But it's great when at a young age, you have the opportunity to do things like that. That was great about the government. They gave me the opportunity to do a lot more than a private firm would have when I first went out. And this firm uh, at Tum Garcia Pedroza gave me the opportunity to do a lot of things early on, exposed me to a lot of things. And I had to learn. I, ha- I had to become you know knowledgeable about it and learn things I didn't know about. And, and forcing me into that situation was great for me personally. And that's one of the difficulties I think young lawyers face. And I talk to my students about that a lot. Um, you know, it's very difficult now as a litigator to get into the courtroom, to get cases where you're actually going to be able to get in there. And and why I tell a lot of them, much like you went to the government there, you know, if you can, the state attorney, the public defender, that's a good way to get a practice of being in court because part of the problem now is there's less and less trials and then clients want the big dog to try the case. They don't want to handle it to some underling. And and so it does get more and more difficult. So you're blessed in that regard to have really gotten that baptism of fire. It was great. I, and I got to work with terrific people. And uh, in about 10 years after getting there, I moved to a, a firm called Broad and Cassell, which was a Florida firm, um, had been around for at that point in time, probably more than 60 years um, and that was a bigger firm. It was a Florida-based firm, but we had offices all throughout the state. So going into a bigger organization, um, it, 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 it didn't necessarily change my practice area and, and what I did, except it, it, it basically, um, the, the clients became a little bit bigger. Um, and some of the cases that we may have dealt with at the old firm, because of conflicts, we could no longer do. And then in, in 2018, Broad and Cassell merged with Nelson Mullins. And Nelson Mullins is a national firm, and it, it's been a great merger. Very 
uh, you know, very similar corporate philosophies. Um, you know, the way the way people look, the 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 people um, have similar outlooks. They're very entrepreneurial. But with a big firm, obviously, there's you know there, there's more administration and there's more potential for conflicts. You always have because other people are representing other you know other folks. And when you have 800 plus lawyers, there's a potential that someone else is representing someone who may be adverse to your potential client. But the the amazing thing is in a big firm like this and the resources, we have every practice area. I have people with expertise in everything. So whenever I have questions, I have all kinds of people I can go to, to, you know, to talk about issues. And, and, you know, the greatest thing, I mean, one of the greatest things about practicing law is talking to people and getting other ideas even about cases and about facts and about the law. And when, no matter what we do, there are other areas of law that impact on the case. You know, you may be doing a contract case, but there may be a healthcare issue in that contract. There may be a HIPAA issue, you know, on whether certain documents can be disclosed and how they have to be protected. So it's great to have that, that wealth of knowledge to be able to go to, or you may have a client that is a litigation client that wants to do a real estate transaction and you have people that will handle that end of it. So it's, it's been great, very comp, you know, complimentary as far as the people that I work with. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, very lucky in that regard. Fantastic. Well, yeah, Mark, Mark and I have a very complex conflict check. I, I ask him, hey, do you have a conflict with this? He asked me, do I have a conflict? That pretty much covers it. And then we get to move <laughs> from there. But but you bring up a great point. And, 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 you know, with the pandemic and a lot of people started working remotely, and I've talked to a lot of lawyers about this. And, and you know, lawyers have the ability to function and work in remotely. And, and we've seen that with a lot of firms. But what's missing from that is I think what you just alluded to. It's the dialogue of being able to maybe walk down the hallway to talk to somebody else and bounce ideas off of them or talk to somebody in a different field that, that sort of is gone. I mean, it's there, you can do it technologically, but, but I think a lot of that sort of natural organic things that happen in a law firm have been kind of taken away from the pandemic and it's gonna be very interesting to see where things go. So what have you guys done you know, are you fully back into the office? Are you hybrid it, or what are you doing? So we are. Uh, I would say we're we're a little bit of a hybrid. Um, you know, technically the goal is to have uh, people back in the offices, but you know, different people have different situations and different comfort levels. And so, and and people may have a situation where they have someone at home that's compromised, or they, you know, during the pandemic they may have had childcare issues where kids weren't in school. So it. it it brought up a whole host of issues. So we are, uh, we're hybrid. Most of the, most of our offices are, are out with, you know, most of the people in the office, but that's not the case at all offices. And some offices we have most of the people working, uh, or, or a good number of people, I should say, working remotely. For me personally, I, I'm, I'm a dinosaur. I always right. say, <laughs> so I never stop coming into the office. I, I like being in the office. I do better work in the office when I'm separated from being home and, and I like to collaborate with people. So in the cases that I was working on, the people I was working with, we were in the office. So we, we were having that collaboration. We were having that discussion. When an idea came up, I would go down the hall and I would talk to my colleague and say, look, what do you think about this? What about that? Here's what I think we should do. Let's try it. Or what do you think of this document I just found? Take a look at this. Or, hey, you know, the, the a witness is coming in for a case. And I, and I don't think you can work with a witness unless they're with you. It, for me, it's much better right. than being in front of me. So, you know, the wit I would have witnesses always come in to, to talk with them and, you know, and meet with them because it, I, I like that, you know, that approach to me is the best way to do it. It's hard to replicate that uh, video. It's not impossible and some people are great at it, but for me, it just worked better with having that collaboration. I think we're social creatures as, especially as litigators, right? We, we like to be with people. We, we like to bounce ideas off. And that's when we do our best work when we're talking to other people. A hundred percent. And and we were blessed in that regard in that, that with a small firm and we had adequate space, we gave people the option. But, but yeah, pretty much from day one, I was able to go back in the office. I mean, I could park my car, go up the elevator, bring my lunch with me. But, but there was something about sort of the mechanism of driving to the office, going to the office, being in the office. And then, yeah, the ability to kick things around because I don't know about you, I often find just verbalizing something. I'll talk to Mark about it. I'll be going back and forth. And when I hear it out loud, I either go, oh, that's going to work or, oh, that's really dumb. 
without even getting feedback. You, you kind of sort it out yourself. But but yeah, alone sort of on your keyboard, that's a lot harder to do. It is tough. I mean, it, it, for me, it, it is tough um, when you can when you can verbalize, when you can bounce around ideas, when you can you know sit with other people and sometimes just think. And you know, sometimes it happens in social conversation. You're not even meaning to talk about the particular case, but then you have an idea and you're like, you know, what do you think about this? And it it, it makes a world of difference. Um, I think to 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 be able to do that. And um, so the, the, the pandemic raised a, you know a lot of a, a lot of interesting issues though, and and. You know, for a, it, it did cause the, uh, you know, disruption in some regards, still has with, you know, in, in oh, certain yeah. ways. And uh, but I do think some great things came out of it. I mean, motion calendar for state court, non, non-evidentiary hearings, motion calendar is probably the greatest thing to do on Zoom. It's five minutes. You're not going to the courthouse. It saves the client's money. It saves the attorney's time. It's a win-win uh, for everybody. And, you know, we were allowed to come in at the beginning of the pandemic, even though the court's you know, have, have been remote. And although they're getting back to, you know, having trials, because apparently some lawyer must have written the Dade County ordinance that said the lawyers were essential personnel and could come into the offices <laughs> even during the shutdown. So I'll leave it to the lawyer to find the loophole to get everybody there <laughs> in the midst of a pandemic. But but we've talked about it in the past. And, and I, I do give a lot of credit, uh, really, the South Florida judiciary. But but I mean, a lot of the state court judges and what they did here in Dade County, they were on the on the front of a lot of this. And so, yeah, those Zoom, the efficiency and use of time for the court and the lawyers and to the benefit of the client to have a motion calendar where everybody can be sitting at their office, you know, and and knock out a five minute as opposed to going to the courthouse, being down there. So it, it has been, and I think you're right, we'll, we'll draw a lot of interesting things out of that. I, I want to ask you about something, because again, another concept that I find fascinating with what you do. And again, I heard you were going to be a receiver, and I thought, well, he's not that tall, but, but you know, maybe he could make it in the league, and I know you're a hockey player, but but talk about it, the, the concept of a receivership, because I know that's part of what you've done, and, and you've done it in some literally hundreds of millions of dollar transactions that have gone on. What is What does a receiver do, and how does that come about? So a receiver basically comes in at the – um, at the, the order of a court, generally in cases. So there, there are many instances where, many situations where it can come about. And actually in Florida, we have a statute called the Uniform Commercial Real Estate Receivers Act for property cases where a court can appoint a receiver. Um, and it, it had been equitable in nature um, before that in a lot of ways, and that the courts have the equitable power to appoint a receiver. The receiver comes in in a very broad, high level um, a receiver will come in and the receiver will essentially be put in charge of a situation, whether it's a, a group of companies or a business. And the idea of the receiver basically is to make the best decision for that, for that business or that, or that property in, in the, the, uh, the Florida statute in federal court. Many times a federal judge will appoint a receiver, the SEC or the FTC or CFTC will sue somebody for fraud. Maybe there were maybe there was a Ponzi scheme that was going on, and they will say, "Judge, we need to have the the agency will say we need to have a receiver appointed so the receiver can marshal the assets." It's kind of one of the point the, the phrases that's used a lot. That means there's a lot of people that have been defrauded here. Let's find out what assets are still there because assets evaporate in those fraud cases. Marshal those assets. Figure out how to recover additional monies for the benefit of, of the estate and ultimately hopefully for those you know defrauded investors in that type of situation. In a property situation, it's trying to figure out the best way to continue you know, to run that property, collect the rents, um, make, and there are other parties involved. There may be a bank that has a mortgage in it. And, and a lot of times it can come about by you know, the bank action. So the receiver comes in and in Florida and, and, and we have statutes that allow folks to recover monies for what are called fraudulent transfers. And that means if something's been at a very high level transferred without value to try and either defraud creditors or for, you know, without value at a time when the entity was insolvent. And the receivers a lot of times will bring what are called clawback cases in these fraud cases and say, you know what, you got paid out money, but, you know, John Smith over here didn't get paid out money and they're down. That money, you got paid out more than you put in. So that money has to come back to the estate to be divvied out, or I was receiver over a group of companies in the healthcare industry at one point in time. We actually 
kept operating those companies and ultimately gave the, the defrauded shareholders interest in those companies, as well as pursued litigation to recover additional monies to distribute out to, to those folks to try and make them as, you know, get them as much money back as possible. Or in the situation, like I said, the property, to keep the property running, to put it back on its feet, make sure it's being administered responsibly. And then you report to the court. Well, that's what I was say. So, so you're sort of appointed by the court and then work for the court Correct. to come back and say, here's how we sort of assess it. But but it's fascinating because it it, it gets to be, I guess, so multi-tentacle because you talk about, you know, the clawbacks. Well, all of those sort of spurn off into their own almost little litigation, right? Right. They're, they are each their own separate litigation. I mean, you try and do it without litigation, and, and but if you can't, you will, and it's the appropriate case, and the facts and the law are on your side, you, you, it's a litigation. And the litigation may be for other things in addition to the clawbacks, you know, in connection with those cases. But the, the business background, at least for me, was a great asset. In, in serving as receiver and representing receivers because understanding how businesses work, even financial statements and, and operations and, and having that law degree background of, you know, of issue spotting uh, were, was a great combination because a receiver, you wear a lot of hats. You're reporting, you're appointed by the court, you report to the court, you're, you're essentially, you know, working for the court. And, and trying to do the best you can to get money back for the investors or right the ship if it's some other type of receivership. But it is, uh, you wear a lot of hats. You're you know, trying to litigate, you're trying to potentially run a business um, and keep the business, if it's a viable business, you wanna keep that business running and hopefully spin it off on the other side of the receivership so it can continue to be a viable business. Just because something bad happened, the business may be, it may still be a good idea and there may be value to it and you don't wanna, you want to try and protect as many people as you can, um, you know, employees and things like that also. So you, you wear a lot of hats and it's a fascinating process. Well, you're also, I would guess, a little bit of a King Solomon in that you're, you're trying to sort of balance the fairness in that versus what you're spending sort of scorched earth to go after everybody out there when, you know, yeah, I guess you've got to make a determination what ultimately is recoverable. So that you're not just wasting resources chasing something and and not being able to recoup. No, great. It's a great point. I mean, you have to make economic decisions the whole time. Uh, you may have a great case, but you may not be able to recover a dollar. You may get a piece of paper if you want. That doesn't make a lot of sense. So you, you have to make economic decisions on what is you know going to be the best use of usually very limited resources that you have, um, and so that the, you're constantly making those decisions. And, and that's both on deciding whether to bring a case, whether it's viable, whether it's collectible, and whether to settle a case, you know, and at what levels uh, makes sense because of the same determinations. So what do you find, and, 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 and it may not, you may not be able to sort of tell me an average, but in cases that you've been involved in and have others where there's a receivership and a lot of people have been defrauded, do you, what, what sort of percentage do you see of recovery for the people that were defrauded? You know, is it a 30? Is it a 50? Is it a 10? You know, where does that sort of rank out? It, it really depends. Each case is different on the cases that I've seen or the cases that I've watched others be involved in. I mean, it, you know, unfortunately, there are some cases where there's no money. The money is it is gone. It has been stolen. It has been sent offshore. And there may and it may be very limited on who you may be able to pursue to recover monies. And it doesn't you don't have the resources or it doesn't make economic sense um all the way to uh you know cases like in the in the madoff litigation there were significant dollars that were recovered for invest now there was one very big recovery out of florida actually that was in the multiple billions of dollars that you know helped that a lot um i've had a receivership where we've been north of you know we're, we're north of 50 percent um you know usually it, it, so it runs the gamut it, it can be it, it really it generally is never and very 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 rarely ever anything close to a hundred. Right. Um, we usually see them trend somewhere between five cents to 25 cents in the area. That's why we're real proud of the one where we're north of 50% on the, on the dollar and we're still going uh, at present. But it, it, each case depends on the facts, on what assets may be there and, and what claims may be available and who you can bring those claims against and how, how you know whether you can recover anything from those folks. Are they collectible? Well, Danny, listen, we could we could talk about this because I'm fascinated by it because, again, something I know very little about 
And so to kind of learn this and, and see the scope of what goes on is really, really fascinating. But unfortunately, we're running out of time. But, but, I, but I think we've established enough, you know, given your expertise and, 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 and you're just a good guy, too, you know, that we might be able to move you off the kill list. And, and so hopefully we'll get the general consensus on that. Well, I appreciate that. And I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. First of all, you know, I, I love speaking with you in general. So it's always great to see you. And, uh, you know, it was a great conversation this morning. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. And anytime. And, and I will also point out that Danny is, is what's your role now in, in, in the alumni? Uh, uh, I, uh, the income, I will be, I am the president elect. So next year I will be the, uh, the incoming president of the UM Law Alumni Association. Fantastic. And, and, and I'm blessed along with Danny and others that we've got a core of people that got three decades, hard, hard to believe, who graduated from law school three decades ago that still call each other friends, which is great, get together frequently. And more importantly, I'm able to pick up the phone and get some really good advice from you, which I, I rely on and often do. No, same here. And, and the stories at our dinners keep getting better. Same story, they, but they, they just the, li the lies get the lies get longer. The stories get better. Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Be, it would be fun to chart it out. You know, the ten and twenty, thirty, because it is the same story. But it's amazing how thirty years and now it's a much better story than it was. It, it is. It is amazing. It well, we've, is. we've got a cast of characters, and I appreciate it, Danny. Really appreciate you spending time today. Uh, partner at Nelson Mullins, fantastic firm that seems to be growing and growing and, and just good luck with all of that. And we will definitely see you soon, my friend. Thank you very much. Thanks again. I'll talk to you soon. You got it. All right. That's it for this week. Next week, we will uh, continue on our quest not to kill all the lawyers. Uh, have a great week and we'll see you next week.